how can people approach setting new habits and breaking old ones? The reasons why we tend to fall off the wagon, especially with New Year's resolutions or other goals, is because we set goals that are either too big or we're setting too many goals or we don't really care about them. So this whole idea of goals that are, say, too many, our brains are only capable of changing up to three things at one time. So if we've set out, say, four goals or three really big goals, that's going to be really hard. Welcome to Soul Wellness. Uh, Today's episode, I have the very amazing and talented Dr. Gina Cleo with us today. Welcome, Gina. Hey, Rachel. Uh, Great to be with you. Good to have you here. Now, I have just finished your book, The Habit Revolution. I'm obsessed. You finished finished it. Oh, my goodness. It's only been on shelves a couple of weeks. I've only got a few pages, but it was literally like to go at the end. But it was literally such perfect timing. Start of the year. Um, you really um, pulled a lot of information together for me. So I can't wait to unpack this with you today. Um, Thank you. I'm so yeah, glad. You've beat my husband. He's not going to be very happy about this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it takes a lot of time, as I know, to write books, right? So all your hard work and yeah. research has gone into this. And, um, you know, for those that don't know, obviously you have a science background, which I think is so important in these things. So bring the science in and really understanding why we do what we do, right? Which is just fascinating. Um, But you have a fascinating story yourself. So you originally worked as a dietitian um, and now you have a PhD, you're an author, you're a speaker, and my favourite accolade, a habit researcher, right? Amazing. Um, So (laughs) before we get into the episode, the question we ask every single person who comes onto the podcast is, what is one ritual that you do every single day without fail and why? I have a few. It's funny, I'm not a habitual person, but I do have some rituals that I'm quite stuck to intentionally. The one that popped to mind straight away was my bedtime routine, my ritual around that. So I've got a little like sleep alarm that tells me that I've got an hour before bedtime. And that once I hear that, all screens are off. And that's a ritual that I love because out of all the sleep hygiene things we can do, having a regular bedtime routine is the most important one. So that's why I do it because I love sleep. I really value sleep. I think it's our superpower. I so that's why I, I love do that. that one. I actually really took that out of your book as well. I, I saw you mention that in there and I was like straight away, that is actually mm. gold because mindless scrolling at the moment is one of probably the biggest time yeah. wasters and really bad habits that we can form. Um, so, wow, well done. I love that one. Oh, thank you. Yeah, phone scrolling is actually the number one unwanted habit. Crazy. And it's now, I've, I see it now really impacting all generations, not just millennials yeah. like it used to. And that just before bed or first thing in the morning seems to be the most use yeah. time or the highest traffic time. It's also the time when our brain wants screens and like that stimulation the least wow. and I suppose it affects melatonin too which then affects sleep like all of that cycle of course okay. yeah plus the stimulation and yeah all of the things wow okay that's great so people are listening to this podcast because they want to look after their wellness right from the soles of their feet to their mind um, and so I guess the changes that they might have to make to help them on this journey is going to be challenging because it's not going to be easy. Mm. So what I want to really talk to you about is how to give them tips and advice on how to make long lasting change and set new habits and break unhealthy ones that are getting in their way. So Great. Well, I'm definitely the right person for the job. Perfect. So <laughs> before we get into it, tell me, how did you get into researching habits? How does a dietitian go to researching habits? <laughs> I was a frustrated dietitian. (laughs) That's how. (laughs) I worked as a dietitian for so many years and I really loved my career. I was working in my own private practice, which was very successful. I was also working in various hospitals. But I did find that people just weren't achieving long-term outcomes like you're talking about. It would be, yep, I can do this. And there's all this motivation and a big drive at the start. And they might get a few days or even a few weeks into a program or a meal plan or a lifestyle change and then they'd end up in my clinic you know working on the same things they we had already worked on before I was also very frustrated with myself I had disordered eating 
you know, I'd finish my clinic and I'd eat a packet of Tim Tams on my way home and be like, what is wrong yeah. with me? Like it's, I don't have a knowledge deficit. I know exactly how this is harming my body. Yeah. I know this is a terrible idea, but why is it that I'm impulsively doing this and it feels mindless and it's so uncomfortable when I don't do it? And I, I had all these questions. Mm -hmm. And so I looked into the research and I found over and over again that it's actually something around like 97 or 98 percent of us who set out to achieve a goal don't end up achieving it and i was like this is outrageous like how how is this why is there not a strategy for this and then looking more into research and and realizing that habits are the only proven method to long-term outcomes and then i was like a dog with a bone <laughs> i needed to know everything about habits and did my phd in Amazing. habit change well done I just as you were saying you. that it resonated so much because I think like most of our mm. my listeners today will be thinking you know we are high achievers we are driven people we are focused we know we have the knowledge right so why do we do these yeah. things why do we reach for the block yeah. of chocolate or why do we and why do we just mindlessly eat or why do we mindlessly do things yeah. that we know aren't good for us um, so mm. this is so good so can you just break it down for me really easy like what is a habit so a habit is essentially a behavior that we've repeated so often in the same context that our brain has made it automatic or subconscious because our brain is you know, making 35,000 decisions a day. So it really wants to preserve energy. And it does that by automating some of the things that it's recognized that we do repeatedly. So habits essentially are automatic behaviors or actions or thoughts or attitudes or belief systems that are ingrained in our life and they're ingrained and they're triggered sorry by they're, they're triggered by an environment and it could be our internal environment or external environment but yeah a habit you know it's such a it's interesting even you know this question always trips yeah. me which sounds outrageous because the description of what is a habit is so neurosciencey and so like yeah. technical. And when I try to break it down, I'm like, but you've got to make sure the triggers in there yes. and oh, there's a reward. And like, it's such a formula. There's a real mechanic um, in well, what is a habit. I actually didn't realize so much that until I read your book. And that for me was like, yeah. whoa. But I actually felt a huge relief because I could see clear mm. reasons why I was not you know, I, I'd set these habits for myself and be like, right, I'm going to do this. And I wake up, I'm very disciplined. Yeah. Like I have a very strong morning routine. Mm. I eat really healthily. But like many people, I'll go, I'm going to stop that 3 p.m. snacking, right? But then yeah. the 3 p.m. snacking, you know, you, you, no matter how much you think you're going to do it, it comes to a point and then you change your mind. So I would love to know, mm -hmm. like, what is the neuroscience behind it? Like you mentioned these triggers or this loop, like what is a habit loop? Yeah. Yeah, so a habit loop describes the three ingredients that are found in every habit. And it is the trigger, the habit itself, and then the reward. The trigger, there's five different habit triggers. And all the triggers fall into one of five of these five categories. They are the time of day, the place that you're in, what you've just done beforehand, so your preceding action or event, how you're feeling emotionally, or the people that you're around. So the time of day could be, say, 3 p.m. triggers a snack time. Uh, the place you're in could be when I'm in the kitchen, I grab a glass of water. Or when I'm at my desk, I check my emails. What you've just done beforehand, so a common one that I do is when, when I've had dinner, I feed my dog. So it's always like what I do straight after my dinner. The emotional state can be emotional eating, for example. It could be when I feel lonely, I scroll on my phone. And then the people that we're around form very much a part of our environment. So we do certain things around certain people that we may not do around others. It could be smoking, partying, swearing, um, drinking coffee, like it could be so many different things. But our social environment also impacts certain habits that we wouldn't do if we weren't around those particular people. And then the last part of that habit loop is the reward. Every single habit we have, both wanted and otherwise, gives us some kind of reward. It could be dopamine. It could be the comfort in our rhythms. Yep. Uh, it could be familiarity, efficiency, you know, so many things, but every habit gives us a reward. Amazing. See, I wouldn't have always thought that when I think of like negative habits, like say, for example, comfort eating yeah. or just mindlessly yeah. eating because you're busy or you're snacking or you don't know why. 
I would, wouldn't have mm. really thought about the reward side of it. I would have thought, you know, yeah. next comes guilt and why did I do that um, rather than the reward yeah. side, which you said, the comfort, the distraction, whatever it is that we're searching yeah. for. It's so true and it's actually really difficult to admit that our unwanted habits give us a reward yeah. because – you know, without the reward, we wouldn't keep doing it because our reward system is what embeds habits in our life. Yeah. It's when our brain goes, well, that felt good or that worked for me. Let's do that again. That's what reinforces habits. If we didn't get a reward, we wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't continue doing the behavior. But rewards can also be conflicting with our values. Mm-hmm. Having, you know, overeating, for example, it's going to make you feel good in the moment. That's why it's called comfort eating. Yeah. It's, it gives you comfort in the moment. There's a hit of dopamine. There could be some sugar in that, which gives you some serotonin. Mm-hmm. But it's the aftermath that we remember. It's the guilt, the shame, the feeling grotty. It's all of those things are also there. And both of those experiences are real. Wow. So in your experience, can people really change? I mean, this is a question that gets thrown around a lot. I would <laughs> love to know what you think. Yes, they can, (laughs) which is why I love, I love this space so much because of the transformative power of it. You know, I've, I've experienced it in my own life. I run habit change courses where I've seen it with literally thousands of people, people who have said to me things like I've, I never understood why I do the things I do. And now that I understand it, I've been able to break it. You know, I went to my physio a couple of years ago and I only chatted to him one time. He's like, so what do you do? And I chatted to him and he had a nail biting Mm. habit. And that time I interacted with him was the last time he ever bit his nails, even though he'd been doing it his entire life. And I know that because I saw him a year later and he he said to me, since that day I met you, I haven't bitten my nails since. Mm -hmm. It absolutely is transformative from those small habits to big mindset habits, to negative self-talk, to the way we respond in relationships, to how we save money or do business. If, you know, up to 70% of everything we do is on autopilot in in this habit space. So it's so scary. completely transformational. When you think of something like seventy yeah. percent of the decisions you make are order, in autopilot. Like that's I know quite right? alarming. Yeah. Um. So it's true. Take take me back to when you saw your physio. So what did you actually mm. say to him that you think <laughs> might have helped in your reflection of that interaction? I described to him the habit loop. Actually, okay. I I he because I kind of just looked down. You know, he was. Mm manipulating my legs I had a really sore leg at the time and I was just looking down at what he was doing and he thought that I'd noticed his Uh nails and felt embarrassed by that that's you know his interpretation of the scenario which is completely understandable and he said yeah this is a really bad habit and I was like oh what's a bad habit and he's like oh I bite my nails and I said oh why do you think you do that or when when do you find that you do that and he was able to unpack he's like I do it when I'm bored, generally when I'm driving or this. And and I was able to, I guess, find a pattern mm. that there's a reason why he does this and there's a there's a rhythm mm. in the, the pattern of what he's doing. And then he was able to just to preempt it before it happened and mitigate it. So he said, now I wear gloves when I drive. Mm-hmm. When I'm sitting like watching telly, I'll make sure I've got like a fiddle stick or something that I'm playing with. And that's really helped him just to break it. And he's done it overnight. Wow. So really it's becoming aware, isn't it? It's awareness of what the patterns are, why you're doing them and Mm. what you're feeling at that time. Like the feeling part, I guess, is we're we're very much a society that is in autopilot. We don't often think about our feelings. You know, we react, we're busy, we're this. We don't actually stop um, and think, what what are we actually feeling in our body? What are we thinking about right Mm. now? Um. It's so true. And I think the other thing is when we realize that what we're doing doesn't align with our values, it actually becomes really hard to want to keep doing it because we get in this space of cognitive dissonance if we're trying to behave outside of our value system. So when, you know, the way that I helped myself to break out of emotional eating, I would say to myself, you know, eating this whole packet of Tim Tams is going to make you feel so good right now, (laughs) but only right now. And then only minutes later, not even a whole minute later, actually, you're going to feel absolutely rubbish. Is that worth it for you? Some days 
I would be like, yeah, you know what? It's worth it. I don't care. <laughs> and then, but most days I was like, no, it's really not worth it. This doesn't align with my belief system of who I am and what I want for myself. And, and it just, you know, it stopped as, as a result of that. So yeah, understanding what triggers us mm -hmm. and what we're doing, but also what it's doing for us and actually is it really achieving the thing that we want it to be achieving yeah. is a really powerful thing. That is so powerful. Um, so we often hear people say it takes 21 days to change a habit. Um, but <laughs> I noticed in your book that you mentioned it is not, in fact, 21 days. Um, <laughs> there is a lot of um, difference in the research. So can you take me through where the research is at yeah. just now and how long does it actually take to pick a habit? Yeah. It's nowhere near 21 days. It is like the biggest like <laughs> wives tale ever that's just like come through the centuries. So it's actually anywhere from 21 days or three weeks. It's actually 18 days, but maybe we just round it off to three weeks to, you know, up to like 10 months wow. or there's like, I think it's like 265 days. And essentially why there's such a big range is because how long it takes you to develop a habit is going to depend on how habitual you are as a person, how consistent you are with doing the habit. If you have a supportive environment, how stressed you are, you know, the more stressed you are, the less your brain is in a learning state. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be absorbing new behaviors as easily. Yeah. And also how complex the habit is. Complex habits take much longer than simpler habits. So there is an average time. The research shows it's around 66 days or 10 weeks. Uh, the latest study, which actually isn't in my book because it only just came out, showed that, but, you know, same, same kind of mm -hmm. data. So it, it wasn't a huge deal. But people who were asked to do simple health behaviors, like washing their hands, took two weeks to make that automatic. Mm -hmm. People that were asked to do something more complex, like going to the gym, mm -hmm took anywhere between seven and, uh, sorry, four and seven months wow. to develop that into a habit. And it makes sense yeah. because getting to the gym requires so many micro steps. There's, there's planning, there's energy required, there's motivation, there's driving, getting dressed, like there's all sorts of things compared to just washing your hands, which for the most part, you always have water around. It's pretty simple. It only takes you a couple of minutes. And it's, you don't have to be overly motivated yeah. to do it. That's incredible, four to mm. seven months, because most people, when they set out, yeah. if you think of New Year's resolutions, right, within two, three yeah. months, they think yeah. they fail, they give up, right? How many times does that happen? Yeah. I, I actually didn't think of it as a cycle. So how can people approach mm. setting new habits and breaking old ones? Like, how would you, like, if you're meeting someone for the first time and giving them a little bit of advice, how would you approach? Because you mentioned micro and I know in your book you mm. talk a lot about the micro steps and I think that is yeah. gold. So would you like to tell us more about that? Yeah, micro habits. I think, you know, some of the, the, the research shows that the reasons why we tend to fall off the wagon, especially with New Year's resolutions or other goals, is because we set goals that are either too big or we're setting too many goals uh, or we are, we're not, they're not real. We don't really care about them. Like we're doing it because, you know, our neighbor's doing it or our friend decided to do it. So this whole idea of goals that are say too many, we'll start with that one. Our brains are only capable of changing up to three things at one time. Wow. So if we've set out say four goals or three really big goals, that's going to be really hard for our brain to sort of get its head around. I mentioned before we make 35,000 decisions wow. every single day. Our brain is busy. It does not want too many more changes. So there's that. And then there's goals that are too big. What happens when we set goals that are, I guess, outside of our realm of either capacity or skill level is our brain goes into a state of hyper arousal, which is actually a fight or flight state. And it's where we will procrastinate or freeze. We don't really Guilty. want to start. Guilty, yeah, because yeah, our brain's like, yo, like, what's the point? I'm not actually going to achieve this anyway. It's kind of like playing a tennis match with Serena Williams. <laughs> I mean, you feel defeated before you've even, before she's even served the ball because yeah. you're like, no, 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 I don't, I don't want to be part of this. No way. <laughs> yeah. And our brain does that. And so when our goals are too big, I think especially with New Year's resolutions, I see people often... You know, we make a goal in a certain state, but then when we need to actually action that goal, most often we're in a different kind of state. Let's say you've set a goal not to snooze your alarm tomorrow. When you've set that intention, 
you've, you're motivated, mm-hmm. you're not sleepy, you're not in a comfortable warm bed. In the morning though, when that alarm goes off and you really want to snooze, at the time it's dark outside, you're really comfortable, you're tired, like you could just sleep a little longer, you're going to have a completely different mindset to snoozing. With New Year's resolutions, I think we feel like the turn of the new year comes with all this motivation, we're going to have more time, we're going to be less stressed, we're going to have more energy. But realistically, that's not true. It's we're going to be the same as we are right now. So the idea of micro habits is probably one of the most important lessons in the the behavior or the habit change space. And a micro habit is essentially a smaller, simpler version of the habit that you're trying to change. And that can be smaller in terms of how often you do it. It could be how long you do it. So you might just like make it shorter or you might not do it as frequently. So it's just a smaller version. Once that becomes habitual, then you build on it wow. until you've reached the greater, you know, the greater goal. Right. Like even going to the gym, for example, you might go for a 10 minute walk as opposed to even using yeah. weights, you know, something like that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Or it could be, you know, if you want to go four days a week to the gym, you might just start with one day a week and that's all you yep. do. Or you might go and you you do 10 minutes of weights and you just sort of like feel your way into yep. it. And then like you can build it up from there. I think there's so much power in that. Um, I know for myself, mm. like even, you know, we're health professionals, we know the value of health and wellness. We know we need to put the effort in, but when we get busy, sometimes other things take yeah. precedence and then you don't do them. Oh yeah. And I find I'm much better when I just have small, like, you know, I used to want an hour in the morning to myself to do my rituals and it's just not reality. Mm. So I just give myself no. 10 minutes and I just squeeze it into the 10 minutes, you know, meditation, yeah. gratitude, reading a book, getting that mindset right. Because if you do make it too mm. hard, like you said, when it was an hour, I'd be like, oh my God, I don't have an hour. I'm just not going to do it today. And then you don't do yeah. anything. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's what I find, you know, when we when we set out to do something we know we can achieve, self-efficacy yep. is the number one predictor of success. It's the number one wow. predictor of success. So if we set out something like, you know, for example, like morning routines, we know that doing things like breath work, meditation, reading, journaling, mm-hmm. exercising, having a healthy breakfast, getting some sunshine, mm-hmm. drinking plenty of water – connecting there's so many things that we're told to start our mornings with it's impossible we'd spend the whole day doing it if we had to do them all so I pick one I'm like I'm just gonna do this one thing today I know I can achieve that and I'm much more likely to do it otherwise it's overwhelming love that that's a really really important message I think there is such a thing as like overload you know just overloading with information and things to do and then before you know it you're just piling Mm. more and more up in your head um which then just you know, I guess it drops your drive and your willingness to want to even achieve those habits. Um, so that's great. Completely. I think it shatters our motivation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, there was an interesting part in your book when you spoke about ego depletion, okay, and oh, yeah. replenishing your um, self-control. And I could mm. relate to that. I never would have thought it was an ego thing, but I was like, oh, my God, mm. that is what's happening to me at 3 <laughs> o'clock in the afternoon because <laughs> – my willpower is so strong, but then I get to a certain yeah. point. I think I'm tired. I'm worn out. I've you know made some big decisions, and I mm. really need to look at myself. So, can you just take us through a bit of what ego depletion even is? Um, I'd love for you to yeah. tell the listeners. Oh, when I learned about the limitations of our self control and ego depletion, it completely changed my life because I realized I wasn't failure. I wasn't, you know, just, I, I didn't lack discipline. I just was trying to use a depleted resource. So think of self control like a muscle. And the more you use it, the more exhausted it gets. So, say you're at the gym and you're doing a set of Uh, say dumbbell lifts so you're doing some like bicep curls eventually your arm is going to get sore and you're going to need to put the weight down and rest your arm before doing another set of lifts and self-control works in much the same way the more you put on your self-control the more demand that you put on it the less resources you have of it for other tasks Uh and the things that deplete our self-control are like all the time right it's things like sleeplessness being hungry making decisions, taking initiative, feeling negative emotions or having a difficult conversation with somebody, Um, stress, fatigue, like so, so, so many things, driving through traffic, time restrictions. So if you get to the office and there's a pile of emails and there's just a lot for you to get through, that kind of pressure depletes 
your self-control. So no wonder (laughs) after a long, hard, emotional day, the last thing we want to come home to is salad. We're like, no, I need I'm going to need sugar, yeah. I'm going to need wine, yeah. I'm going to need cheese. It all makes sense. Like it completely does. Yeah. So, so how do you work Yeah, so it? that's – that. well, that state of diminishing self-control is called ego depletion. Mm-hmm. We can replenish our self-control by things like rest, sleep, meditation, taking periodic breaks throughout the day, having something to eat with a bit of uh, low GI carbohydrates mm-hmm. in it, like whole grains, for example, or some fruit. But really the idea is to not avoid ego depletion, is to try to not try to not enter that state at all. And the beauty about creating habits is our habits don't need self-control. They happen automatically. No matter how tired or hungry or grisly you are, you will always put your seatbelt on in the car because it's an automatic habit that you'll always do. And so we want to get our habits into a state where they don't need self-control, they're automatic. And that's how we live a life that's so free from needing to use our cognitive resources and not, you know, falling into ego depletion. Love that. Um, So as we're boosting up our, I guess, our self-control, is that what you would call it? Or what Mm -hmm. was the terminology? Yeah. Yeah. That's good. So in that situation when you're snacking, say it's like three o'clock and eating a whole thing of crackers or you're hungry and mindlessly <laughs> eating. So maybe taking yeah. a walk beforehand, making sure you're eating enough as well before you're getting to that yeah. point, which is what I think I'm guilty of. Busy, yeah. ha- you know, having a late breakfast, but then not maybe having enough for lunch um, and then mm. ending up in that. The, yeah, yeah. exactly. I find that when I need to take a break at work, I used, you know, when I was doing my PhD, I used to just like go and have a snack and that would just be the way I took a break. And I, I put on some weight and I, was, I called it PhD weight <laughs> also because I was sitting down a lot. Yeah. Um, but really, I was just trying to find the right words in the pantry for some reason. But what I found is, you know, I, when I started learning more and more about habits, I'm like, okay, what I actually need is a break. Mm-hmm. And yes, taking a snack or having a snack gives me a break, but I actually need a mental break. Yeah. So what does that look like? And I started doing just five minutes of yoga nidra where I would lay in my hammock or on the floor and I'd put my sound cancelling headphones in and I would do some meditation on the mm. ground and it would ju- I would just shut down yeah. for five minutes and take that rest and give my brain a rest. And it was like I'd had a 20-minute nap and a snack mm-hmm. and I just couldn't believe how beneficial it was and I could get up and keep going on my work. And I, I think when we really get in touch with what it is that our body's asking us for. What is it that I'm actually needing right now? Is it a break? Is it a snack? Like, what mm-hmm. is it? Then we can we can serve it in the right way. And, and then it helps us by, you know, functioning the way that we want it to. That's amazing. Um, I actually am a big fan of yoga nidra too. I did some on Saturday afternoon. Oh, cool. <laughs> just amazing. Just, um, you know, 20 minutes. And it actually feels like you've yeah. had a very deep bone sleep doesn't it? Even if you just drift yeah. off for, you know, 10 minutes or something. Um, yeah, amazing. it's so true. Um, yeah. I've actually recorded a yoga nidra track uh-huh. that's, um, it's on my website. It's on the page of where it says book yeah. as, as a track. I did it with a really good friend of mine who's a beautiful Australian musician and we, we recorded it together and it's, I mean, it's really weird yeah. meditating to my own voice, <laughs> but it's also one of the most soothing yeah tracks that i've heard it's it's 10 minutes and the music is just stunning so beautiful yeah i'll, I'll send you the yeah, link let's to pop that it in the show notes afterwards and people can grab that yeah oh, thank you um cool. so a quote you have on your website is the difference between who you are and who you want to be is what you do and i think that mm. is such a powerful because it's all in the doing right everything's in the doing yeah and this is such a pivotal time where people have obviously been thinking about this beginning of the year so Mm. what advice do you have for people who are feeling maybe a little bit negative about themselves at the moment and some of the big things Mm. they set themselves out for if we could give them an example like what might you say like for example I'll give you mine was I wanted to go to the gym every single day I obviously haven't achieved that I'm definitely better at it and I'm trying not to be Mm. hard on myself Um, but what would you say to people who are in that state? Because obviously the more negative they are about not achieving their goals or their habits, then it's going to reinforce that negativity. Yeah, absolutely. I think whatever your habit is, make it even more micro Mm -hmm. than it is now. And it's really about humbling ourselves and 
being okay with taking the smaller step and that being all that it is. Yeah. You know, a few years ago, I went through a really traumatic event, which I talk about in the book. And I went from running this very successful global company, uh, running the health and wellness of the students at the medical center at Bond University. I was the head mm. of that to not even being able to leave my house. I, uh, brushing my teeth would be the only goal that I had in that day. And it was pretty wild for me to go from this, you know, this high yeah. achieving kind of role, this like real powwow time to being so broken mm. that all I, all I like, all the only thing that I could have the ambition to do was brush my teeth. My head wanted me to do so much more. My head wanted me to be who I was before and yeah. go to the gym and drive to work and do all those things. But my emotions and where I was at, my capacity wasn't there. And I had to sit myself down and have that conversation with myself like, Gina, it's okay. You will get there. This is just where you're at now. We just need to rewire, rewire the brain again and get back to where you were eventually. But it's the acceptance of this is my capacity mm. and that's okay. It's not always going to be like this. Yeah. But it just, I just need to start on starting, just taking the first step, just showing up and the rest eventually will come from that. But just show yeah. up. You know, I talk about a story in the book where the guy called Gary yeah. who just put his shoes on for the first week, that's all he did, yeah. just put his active shoes on. And then from there, he eventually ran a 10 kilometer race. Now, had I told Gary, I want you to run 10 yeah. kilometers, he said to me, I would have, he said, I would have walked out of your office and given you a bad Google review. <laughs> that was a powerful story. But he was setting out to do something achievable. Yeah, it was really yeah, powerful thank you. because you were talking about him just walking around the house and then, you know, he ventures out yeah. to the street and just does a little bit on the street. And I think there's mm. so much power in that because so many people think, oh, I could never run a marathon or I could never do this. And I think mm. that, yeah, thinking of that goal too far into the future makes it really challenging. Um, yeah. But also going back to your experience um, when you went through trauma, um, how mm. long did you sit in that traumatic space for? Because this is also something like I went through a traumatic experience last year. Um, my son was diagnosed with mm. type 1 diabetes and he's only nine years mm. old and it was like quite a shock. You know, we're in hospital yeah. and for months yeah. later I was in this like state of, I would say looking back, not depression, but it was just very low, very, very low feelings, yeah. which is life, right? Lots of people go through these yeah. traumatic events. And then how you pick yourself up. I think it took me six months, six mm. months to actually yeah. go, you know what, there is a bit of an issue here. Like you're really sad, you know, you're not doing the things yeah. you used to do. How do you kind of break out of that? And I was just curious to know how long you sat in that mm. state for before you said that's enough. Oh, it's hard to answer this one because it was very much a, a two steps forward, one mm. step back process for me. There's so many times where I thought I was doing okay and then I'd be triggered mm. by something and I'd end up, you know, back in my bed for three days straight where I couldn't have any sort of human contact and, and then it would feel like I'm back at square one, although I wasn't. It felt like it at the time. I would say that I guess triggers stopped being earth shattering for me. After maybe a year to 18 months yep. from my trauma. So what happened to me is my ex-husband cheated on me. Um, he was going to brothels and hiring escorts and prostitutes. And the way that I found out was awful. Like it was popping up on the screen in front of me as I was trying to bake some banana bread at home while he was out at the shops. And it was a live exchange, text message exchange he was having with a prostitute he was about to meet with. And then I found hundreds others oh. and we, we were together for six years, but we'd just gotten married and it was the whole thing was, was horrible. But then everything triggered me. Yeah. <laughs> everything that reminded me of him triggered my traumatic response. Yeah. So it took some time for me to even figure out what was triggering me because sometimes I'd be triggered and I'd be like, I don't exactly know what it is. I just know that I'm not safe here. Mm -hmm. You know, that's yeah, so it was. It took a while. I, I'm remarried, not to the same guy. I know obviously. Your, your new husband, by the way, <laughs> sounds like a keeper. I love. He's yeah. very strict. He's a legend. Mows lawn in straight lines. I love that. Very oh yeah, habitual. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's in the book. Yes, he is. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Like we do things this way. I'm like, okay, that's good though. You need the yin and yang, right? <laughs> yeah, totally. We are the perfect yin yeah. and yang. And Mitch just says it how it is. You know, like people on their first date will be like. Oh, so what do you do for work? Or do you have any siblings? Mitch was like, 
So what's the most traumatic thing you went through and how did you get through it? I'm like, really, wow. homeboy? This is date one question. All right, sit down. It wasn't that long ago. <laughs> yeah. That's, and I love it. He's just, he's safe because he's just says it how it is. That's right. So it's so good we can come to the other side of that with you. But I think also that experience yeah. of being able to know what that feels mm. like to be in those shoes as someone of not being able to move, you know. And even sometimes just oh, listening yeah. to something like this is enough to – Yep, okay, so it's one step at a time. You brush your teeth. You yeah. just did one little thing, one thing at a time until you could get back to, yeah. I guess, doing all the habitual things again. Is that? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, ex- exactly. And and more, you know, than it was before. But it's still a journey, yeah. you know. It's been several years, but even now sometimes, you know, Mitch will put his phone down really quickly as I enter the room and the story I tell myself yeah. is, what's he really yeah. doing on his phone? Yeah. But the beautiful thing about our relationship is I can talk to him about that. So there's consistent healing and and sort of uh, like rewiring old cycles and belief systems. Now, before, like when we were first together, I'd have a complete adrenaline dump and a panic attack. Now it's a blimp. It's like, oh, that's a bit uncomfortable. Like, but I can even just move on from it and forget that I even felt that and start talking about something yeah. else, why I actually entered the room. Yeah. And that's the beauty of neuroplasticity is that we're not stuck with our brain. No. Is that at any point in time, whatever habit we have, we totally have the power to change and rewire our brain. Our brain is made to be rewired. It's the mechanics of it. So every habit we don't want in our life, we can break it. And every habit we want in our life, we can create it, whether it's a thought, a trigger, an emotion, a reaction, a behavior, it can be anything. Sorry, I just lost you for a second. Um, I love that. Oh, you're back? I just lost you for one second. Yes, Um, I lost you too. Yeah, yeah, so I think that that is so powerful, so powerful, the neuroplasticity. Mm -hmm. And I think... You know, people not believing that they can change, that is the key problem here. Like everybody has a power to change. You just have to want it enough, I think. I lost you there, Rachel. Sorry, can you repeat what you just said yeah, before? Sorry. I was just saying about the neuroplasticity, sorry. how amazing it is. Oh, yeah. Absolutely yeah. incredible. Incredible tool. So like, okay, so people now understand they can do it. They can start these micro habits. What is your recommendation on tools to use? Because like you you recommend a few really great tools in the book. So I'd love to know what you think is a really good way of tracking. And also just for that brain registration to know, to register that, yes, we are doing this. And yes, like pat on the back. (laughs) Yeah. So with the reward system, again, like the way we want to track our habits and is actually one of the most essential steps in changing our habits is using a habit tracker. And there's plenty of apps or there's analog ones or like paper-based ones. And a habit tracker, essentially what it is, you write down the habit that you're wanting to change and you tick off every time you do it or you decide not to do it if you're trying to break the habit. It's kind of like giving a child a gold star whenever they do their chores or do something good and they get that sense of reward and they're motivated and they want to do it again. We don't grow out of that reward learning as adults. So when you give yourself a tick on a habit tracker, your brain's like, well, that felt pretty good. So I want to do that again. And it helps to reinforce the habit. It's also a beautiful way of being able to visually see your progress. I think for so long, you know, we could be doing something for ages and not realizing that we've actually been putting in all this effort for a really long time. And the rewards are there because when a habit just becomes part of our life, we forget that we n- never used to do it before. Yeah. <laughs> so having that habit track is a really beautiful, uh, I guess, visual uh, expression of all the effort that you've been putting in. It's also a really cool way if you're competitive like me, you don't want to break the streak. So there's a few habits that I'm like, oh, I don't really want to do that today. But I'm like, oh, but I don't want to break the streak of having like, you know, I've got like 28 ticks. I can't have, you know, one gap before the yeah, next yeah. tick. So it motivates you to yeah. want to keep going. I love that. <laughs> do you recommend parents use them with their children? You know, I don't, I haven't worked with yeah. children before, so I'm not sure, but... The parents that I have Mm -hmm. spoken to who have used it with their children have said it's been brilliant as long as the reward Mm -hmm. that the child gets is meaningful to them. So you can't set a reward that you think they like if they're not, if they're like, I don't really care about this. The reward's not going to like the process and the wiring in the brain's not going to really connect. 
yeah exactly it has to be like what do you want every time you achieve this like what's valuable for you yeah. Yeah. I just think that's so powerful because kids these days, you know, we're trying to get them to do chores around the house and be invested mm. in different goals, whether it's, you know, getting better at music or and teaching them these tools from a young age is going to help them so much throughout life. So it makes sense to me to want mm. to try and bring that into the household. I just think habit trackers seem like a great yeah. idea. And I am definitely, I'm going to put this out there now, Gina, because I'd like us to reconnect <laughs> maybe in 12 months. Um, yeah. My habits, one thing, a couple of things that I really noticed was the 3 p.m. snacking, which I really want to mm. kick. Um, yeah. The regular uh, weight training every single day, which I really, you know, I'm going to do that micro. I'm going to take your advice. Yeah. Do it micro. Yeah. Because even saying every single day, my head's like, is that yes. micro? Yes. It sounds like a lot. Are you going to take a break yeah. and rest day? Yes. <laughs> I see what you're heading with that. So it's maybe moving my body every day, whether it's walking my dog, which I do yeah. in the morning. Love it. Or going to the gym much more graceful um, yes love it but one of my biggest habits that i really want to kick and um and it's really interesting because i i've, I've reading your books made me reflect on why i do it i go to my mm. local coffee shop every day to buy a coffee and i have a very expensive coffee machine at home that grinds beautiful coffee but it doesn't taste the same and i've got myself into this mm. habit of like that's how i start my day um yeah and it's just such a key of like it's a habit right so if i manage to yeah. kick it at home then i don't need to go get my coffee that's true. Or you can just buy their beans if that's the that difference today in the taste. I was like, like, oh, you yeah. did? <laughs> Wise woman. I'm I like, love I'm it. Gonna try. I'm determined to try and kick yeah. this habit because I've realized it's yeah. it's such a strong habit. And when you start to notice, mm. I don't feel right unless I go do that. Like that's when I'm like, okay, you need to try and, try and change this a little bit. Yeah, I have the same mm. thoughts. I'm like, if, the moment that I feel uncomfortable mm. about giving something yeah. up, that's when I know I need to yep, give it up. Mean. And I've done it with things like oh, I used to have like tea in the mornings. I can't have a lot of caffeine. So I have a cup of tea and even the tea can be like different, yeah. right? But I was like, then I'd go on holiday and there'd be no tea and I'd be like, oh, or it's too hot for tea. And it would just like put me in a wig out. And I'm like, this is not okay. Like I want to, so I will often, I love that you do that. I will often be like, what do I feel uncomfortable about giving up? And it's like, cool, that's gone. Yeah. But it, obviously there's fundamental things that will always continue, yeah. like moving my body, brushing my yeah. teeth, having a shower, you know, those will never change. Yeah. That's so good. <laughs> um, but I'm determined to challenge myself and just see how much I can mm. improve in this by All the right. time we talk. 12 yeah, months. 12 months. You're on. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. I really, really loved having you on the podcast. Um, and so mm. I'm just going to finish with one final question. And I'd love to know because okay. we chatted about podcasts earlier and I know you love podcasts too. Um, what are you yes. listening to or what are you mm. reading? Because I, I love books and I love podcasts. I'd love to know yeah. what you're listening to. Ooh, okay. What am I listening to? I've, I've always got like five audiobooks on the go, but also podcasts. I listen to a bit of Huberman, although I'm like, why are they three hours? This is like a lot. Um, I also love listening to all things brain, like all in the mind. Yep. I like listening to that. I love like there's a, a few sort of behavior psychology ones that I listen to. I'm also really interested in relationship psychology just for my own yep. self. So any podcasts on like attachments I quite enjoy I'm just a geek all the neuroscience yeah. stuff you'll watch me doing what am I reading okay on my bookshelf from what I'm reading I've got two books on the yeah. go well I've actually got like five yeah. but so have I Is that <laughs> but they're all doing yeah it's really I've yeah, got three actually well I've fun. almost finished yours I've only got a couple of pages to go Oh gosh. And okay, and it all and it does it depend on the mood, like what mood you're in is what you'll read. Yeah. Yeah, I'm the same. Okay. At the moment I'm reading A Mountain Is You by Brianna Wiest. I actually referenced this book in my book. I've heard about that. And book. that's like a Yeah, it, I've heard it's great and it is. I mean, you know, I'm only a couple of chapters in it and it's really good. It's sort of about facing yourself and like you know, self it's all about self-sabotage type of thing. Yeah. And this is these two books here are have been pillars in my recovery and my healing, and they're both from the same author, Bianca Sparancino, and one of them is called A Gentle Reminder, and the other one's called The Strength in Our Scars, yeah. and they're sort of like love letters to self yeah. that she's written. They, I, I these it's the kind of book where you just read one or two pages and then you just got to soak it in and put it away because yeah. it's like a lot. Yes, I will always have these around me. 
And then the main book I'm reading again, this is the second time I read it through, is Self Compassion by Kristen Neff, oh, one of my favorite books. Heard of that one. And I'll a lesson I'm forever we'll continuing to learn is Self Compassion. It's amazing. Self Compassion. Love it. Well, obviously, you know, <laughs> I'm reading this, which I highly recommend yes! everyone to read. I think the it's something for the whole family. I've even told my husband he's got to read it too. Oh, um, thank and you. I'm just finishing Elena Dokic's Fearless. Um, oh yes how's that been it's it's heavy it's another one it's heavy Mm. so you just do it in bite-sized chunks she's such a powerful powerful woman um Mm. i love her thought process and her messages that she's sharing um for everyone not just in sport but children um families and just even just people speaking up and you know understanding that if something doesn't feel right speak your mind because Mm. A lot of yeah. the trauma that she went through was very clear that she was dealing with it, but nobody sort of stuck up for her. And I just think she's an amazing role wow. model. Um, yeah. But here's amazing. a funny book. And I say funny because I'm reading lots of money books this year. And this one is called yeah. Happy Money. Have you heard of this? Okay. It's, no, I haven't. It's by a Japanese author called Ken Honda. And it's all about making peace with your money and that money is smiling. It's either happy or sad. And we can infuse positive energy when we buy things, pay bills, gift people things. Um, and it's actually a really, really great book. So I love that too. Cool. So yeah. There you go. I like it. Is he the guy who made Honda? I don't know if Honda is no, Japanese. No, it's not. No, He's an okay. interesting guy. He, um, <laughs> back in – so Japan is very like – very a little bit more stricter with like men working and women staying at home with the kids. This is years ago. Like mm. uh, I'd say probably like 20 years ago. Um, it could be wrong, it could be longer, and he actually in his thirties he had his daughter and he decided he wanted to raise her. So he his wife went back to work and he mm. raised her. And this is he was obviously financially set up to do oh, it. And he now him. teaches other dads yeah. how to be financially set up and enjoy the moments with their children. It's actually a really beautiful book. Oh, awesome! Yeah. Love that. Um, so we've cool. got some good recommendations oh. there. <laughs> um, but thank you so much, Gina. Honestly, you. What you're doing in the habit space is revolutionary and I think that goes as a title of your book. So I really enjoyed our chat today. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you having me and, yeah, great to chat with you. Amazing. We'll reconnect in 12 months and see where we're at with habits. Look forward to it. Yes. (laughs) Thanks, Rachel. Bye. Bye.